Our next passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning verses, uh, verses 1 through 11. Um, they're up on your screen as well. Hear now the word of the Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may become, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I also in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. We're coming up on um, Christmas. It's hard to believe already. It's like two weeks away. Um, cannot believe it. One of the two big holidays in the church, Christmas and Easter. Um, you could argue which one's more important, right? If, if there wasn't Christmas, there'd be no Easter. And if there um, was no Easter, then Jesus had a failed mission. Why, why even bother coming down here? And one of the things I love best about these two holidays is the music. I absolutely love the music on on Easter and on Christmas. Right? What, on, on Easter, what is that first song that we sing every year? Christ the Lord is risen to That song, I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. <laughs> break the, break the, the glass will start breaking all around here. But, I mean, but we love those songs, right? I mean, we hear that song, it just pumps us up. Jesus is out of the grave, he is risen. Yes. We love that one, it gets us going. And then on Christmas Eve, there's nothing like the candle lighting, right? The traditional service that we have, we light those candles on. We're playing Silent Night. We're singing Silent Night. The lights are dimmed. We're handing the candle from person to person to person. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to do that in COVID this year, but somehow we'll figure that out. And we, we pass those candles from one to another, singing Silent Night. It's just like the mood is amazing. And then the lights come on, and it's joy to the world, right? We are singing joy to the world right after that. It just fills you up with joy overflowing, all pumped up. And there are a lot of people that come just twice a year. Typically, they're going to be here on Christmas Eve, and they're going to be here on Easter a lot of times. Last year for Christmas Eve, we were standing room only here. But, you know, we see a lot of people we typically don't see. And why do they come those two days? They come because they're looking for a bit of joy. They're looking for something that's going to pump them up, something that's going to take them out of where they are and, and bring them into the presence of God to have some hope, to be filled and overflowing with joy. For some, there, there's joy in the moment, and then it's gone till next Easter. It's gone till next Christmas. Right? For many, there's, there's no other joy in between. They go 364 days without much joy. And then those one days, they come and get the joy. Maybe that's the situation you're in. Maybe you're finding yourself right now short on joy, kind of weighed down by life. I mean, 2020 has not exactly been all roses, right? It's been a tough year. But I have some really good news for you, besides the fact that it's going to be 2021 in January. I have some really good news that Jesus had that. Jesus' coming was for joy. The angel said to the shepherds, tending their flocks by night from Luke 2.10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will come for all peoples. The angel came with good news of not just a little bit of joy, not just some joy, not good joy, but good news of great joy for all peoples. Now, now great joy sounds really great, right? It sounds amazing. Like, great joy, that is awesome. I want some, some great joy. We all want great joy, for good news of great joy for all people. 
But what if you could have something more than great joy? What if you could have joy fully? You could have joy fully. If you could have as much joy as a person can have. If your joy was just overflowing and filled up beyond what, what, what you can even imagine. What if you could have all-out joy? Would you be signing up for that? You could have all-out joy every single day, 365, 24-7. All-out joy, right? Sign us up. We want some of that. But you know what? Here's some more good news. Jesus says you can. Jesus says you can. He said in, in the last verse of that passage I read, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Your joy may be full. If you look at what he literally said, he says, your, your joy is filled up. It's complete. Like it cannot fit anymore. All out joy. And because of his advent, because Jesus came, because he was that baby in the manger who lived that life, came here for us, died on the cross, rose from the dead, because of that, he's telling you that you can have all-out joy if you abide in him. You can have all-out joy if you're abiding in Jesus. Let's see how you, can, how you can do that, how Jesus says you could do that. In our passage, he gives us two keys to all-out joy, and the first one is this, that all-out joy comes through abiding in the good news. All-out joy comes through abiding in in the good news. Jesus said, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Jesus is the vine, right? The Father, God the Father, is the vine dresser, right? He's the vineyard farmer. He's the vineyard grower, and he's going to care, and he's going to work that whole vineyard. And Jesus isn't any old vine. Did you see who he said he is? He said he's the true vine. He's the true vine. In other words, he's the genuine vine. He's the real vine. And he uses this language, which is Old Testament language, actually. It's Old Testament language that speaks of Israel. Right? Israel was, was looked at by the vine, but the, the thing about Israel, the vine in the Old Testament, was that it could never bear any fruit. God was always condemning it because, Israel, you can bear no fruit. But here comes the one that Israel pointed to. Here's the one that the prophets have been waiting for. It's Jesus, and he is the true fruit bearer. He is the one that bared good fruit. Finally, he's come. And in verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Right? So the branches, that's all of us. Right? All the disciples of Jesus Christ, all the followers of Jesus, we're the branches. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And Jesus makes this declarative statement, this pronouncement about the branches, saying, verse 3, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Well, what does Jesus mean when he says, already you're clean? Does he, he doesn't say, go get clean. You're going to be clean. He says, already you are clean. I just have to point out this word for clean is the same word we see in verse 2 for prune when he talks about pruning. It's the exact same word. I don't know why some people translate it prune and, and clean. It's just a couple verses away, and it's, it's exactly the same word, the same Greek word translated two different ways. So clean or, or prune is what, what's happening, this, this process that, that, that happens with these branches to make them more fruitful. And Jesus is saying, the branches, us believers, we are fully cleaned. We are already clean. Right? We are cleaned up. We are fully clean. We are fully pruned. We are fully righteous. Well, wait a minute. How, how can that be? Like, I, I'm not fully righteous. I, I still sin. I'm still broken. I, I try, but I'm not fully righteous. I'm not all cleaned up. What is he talking about? I'm pretty sure no one else here is fully cleaned up. Right? Fully clean, fully righteous. So how can this be? Well, he tells you. He says, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Well, what word, Jesus? I mean, look at my Bible. It's like chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. It's all read. What word are you talking about, Jesus? These are all your words. It's the word you've spoken to us. Well, notice that Jesus didn't say words, plural. He said word. And he didn't say a word or, or some words. He said the word. Right? It's the definite article. It's a particular word that Jesus is talking about here. 
And if you know your, your Bible a little bit, if you know the Gospels where Jesus has talked about the word, like the parable of the sower, where he, he, he's, the, the, the sower goes out and he sows the seed, which the seed is, Jesus says, the word, which is the Gospel. It's the good news, another word for Gospel, that we are saved from our sins by faith in Jesus. The good news that the gospel means you, of the gospel means that you've been saved from judgment of God for rebelling against Him. You see, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what He's done to pay for your sins, you also receive all that righteousness that Jesus earned. That is credited to your account. Not only are your sins forgiven, but you're you now have the righteousness of Christ that He earned perfectly for you. So now you are perfectly clean. That's what He's talking about. That's the word. That's why you're already clean, because of what Jesus has done. He's saying that faith in the word, faith in the gospel, is the root of your salvation. It's the root of your salvation. He's saying it's not only the root of your salvation, but if we look through the whole passage that I read, it's the root of your joy, ultimately. That good news of Jesus, what he's done, having made you already clean, is the root of your joy. And remember, Jesus said, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Right? The gospel, that good news, is a basis, is the basis for our joy. It's the joy of knowing that your situation isn't hopeless. The condemnation, that, that judgment, that, that, that sin in this world has no hold on you. It doesn't own you when you're united with Christ in the vine. There's no more wondering, do I measure up? Am I good enough? Am I enough? Am I lovable? Am I acceptable? Because God says you are. He says you do measure up because of what Jesus has done for you. He has cleaned you up. You are a cleaned up branch in Jesus. And you've got all the reason in the world for joy if you're united with Christ, if you're connected into the true vine. Fear not, fear not. I bring you good news of great joy. Your Savior is coming. He's here at last. You've been rescued. Now, people were looking forward to that day for hundreds and thousands of years. They were waiting for Jesus to come. That's why Advent is so important, because they were waiting for him to come, and now he's come, and we can celebrate that he's coming, and he's coming back. But people have been looking forward to this for so long. When the pregnant Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to see her cousin, Elizabeth, who was also pregnant, Right, Mary's pregnant, Elizabeth is pregnant. She goes on a journey, she goes to visit Elizabeth, who had John the Baptist in her stomach, right? The, the unborn John was in her. And you know what happened when, when, when Mary, with Jesus inside, came and showed up at the house? Luke tells us, Luke 144. When the sound of our greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. The baby inside of Elizabeth, John the Baptist, leaped for joy knowing that the Savior was here, was in the same room, that the Savior had come, the one that they'd been looking forward to for so many years, he had now come. So much anticipation. O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, being cleaned up by Jesus, being made completely clean, is, is believe it or not, that's the beginning. That is the starting point. You put your faith in Jesus, you get cleaned up by Jesus, but that's the beginning. And that's the basis for your joy, the foundation of your joy. Because your union with Jesus is also not only your standing with God, but your sanctification. And that's a big theological word, which means your renovation. It's God working in you to change you. Remember, God's the vine dresser. Right? He's changing you. He's caring for the vine. And he's going to do it with you if your faith is in Christ. I mentioned that, the, that your faith in Jesus is the root of your salvation. But now we're going to see that that root of faith is going to grow up and it's going to produce fruit in the branch. Right? It's the root is your faith, but it's going to produce fruit on the branch. Verse 2, Jesus said, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, meaning the Father, the vine dresser, takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus is saying there are some branches that are not going to bear fruit. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be cut off. They're going to be taken away. They are, they are dead wood, if you will, those branches. They're going to, verse 8, wither and break up. You know, if it's dead wood, it's not going to bear fruit, right? If you have any dead wood, right? any branches you pulled off, like no more flowers, no more fruit, they're going to come on them. They don't belong 
on the vine anymore. And by this, Jesus is saying, there are some within the church, there are some who have been among us, there are some who are in the body of Christ, or, or present in the church, maybe not in the body of Christ, but who are present in the church, who say they're disciples of Jesus, who really are. Verse 8, those who bear much fruit, so prove they are my disciples. Your fruit bearing is the proof that you belong to Jesus, that you're trusting in Jesus. It's, it's the proof of whether you're trusting in him or you're just hanging around the church. Or whether it's just like the social thing to do. Bethany Chapel, they have some pretty good dinners. Let's hang out there. The coffee hour is pretty awesome. Or the people are nice. All good reasons. But that's not the fruit of your faith. The fruit isn't the root of your salvation, but it's the evidence that you're united in Christ. Right? It doesn't, it, it's just the proof, as he said. It's the evidence of true faith. That you're a branch on the vine. And you can't bear fruit without faith in Jesus. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, whoever abides in me and I in him, hear that union with Christ, that abiding with Jesus, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Bearing fruit means abiding in Jesus. It means abiding in that good news that, that, that Jesus came and, and lived that perfect life for you, died for your sins, and has given you his righteousness. Constantly abiding in the grace of God through Christ by which you were saved. And it's that that causes spiritual growth. It's the source, it's the foundation of your spiritual growth. We think of the gospel, that's something, wow, the gospel is something that like we get saved, we believe the gospel, true, we are done, we're moving on to the big stuff now. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Not at all. The gospel isn't once and done. The gospel is for life. The gospel is your root for fruitful living. Apart from it, you can do nothing, Jesus says. He doesn't mean you can't do anything at all. Right? You can still show up here. You can still do other things. He means you can't grow fruit. You can't grow spiritual fruit apart from him. You are dead wood apart from him. But here's the thing you need to understand. Jesus accepts you as you are. When Christ accepts you, when you put your faith in Jesus, he accepts you as you are. He loves you as you are. But because he loves you, he doesn't leave you as you are. He's not going to leave you as you are because he loves you. He loves you so much that he's going to continue cleaning you up. He's going to continue pruning you. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So if you're trusting in Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus today, or if you put your faith in Jesus five years ago, or ten years ago, or fifty years ago, in some of you, you can expect some pruning. And you've already been pruned if you've known Jesus for a while. He's going to start pruning you. Do you know what it means to, to prune something? It means to, like, if you have something that you're going to prune... You know, you're taking all the dead stuff off, all the stuff that's going to keep it from, from growing, right? There's a branch that you're going to prune. You're just pruning off all that dead stuff that, that's going to, you know, anything that gets in the way of its growth. And that's what God is doing in the life of a believer. It sounds kind of painful, right? God's going to be pruning it. You know what? Sometimes it really is painful. Very painful. It can be. And we'd much rather do it ourselves. Like, I'd rather just prune myself. Like, well, you know, I'm going to give up this thing, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to cut off from this, and... You know, for right now, I'm going to be, you know, but, you know what, if, if God let us do it and we really can't do it, um, we, we wouldn't bear much fruit at all. God needs to work in us. He needs to remove what really has to go in our lives. So God removes anything in your life that hinders you from bearing fruit. He prunes them. He, he strips them away. He does it to draw you nearer to him, to trust him more in all circumstances, to abide in Jesus more, to strengthen you, to show you that he's got it. He's got it. Don't worry. I've got it. All for your good. All for your fruitfulness. And in that pruning, God is removing anything that's detrimental to your Christian life. He's taking away everything that's going to keep you from living for Him. He will. He's removing sinful habits. He's changing your priorities. He's changing your values. He's even maybe going to change your relationships with people if they're hindering you from, from knowing Him more and trusting Him more. And as painful as that is, he's doing it out of love for you. He's doing it for your good. He's doing it to make you more like Jesus. 
All this is for good. So that you know you can trust him. And when you look at your trials knowing that, right, it puts it into a whole new light, doesn't it? When you're going through things like that, it just changes your, your whole mindset about it. All of a sudden, these things start happening. At first, you're like, ooh, I don't like that very much. But then you're like, thank you, God, because I know that you're doing this for my good. I know that this is pruning me. I don't know always what you're doing. Maybe you're going to make me more patient. Maybe you're going to make me more loving. Maybe you're going to make me more joyful. Maybe you're going to make me more peaceful for this. I don't know. But Lord, I trust you. All our joy comes from abiding in the good news of Jesus. Okay, the second key to all our joy is that all our joy comes through abiding in God's word. All our joy comes through abiding in God's word. Well, just as you saw in our abiding in Jesus and bearing good fruit is that it's gospel-driven, that, that Jesus is the vine, that we are the branches, that, that he's the gas in our tank, the gospel is, is what keeps us going. He's, he's the power. That, it's, it's that same power, it's that same engine that, that caused our fruitfulness and all our joy. It's also going to help us abide in his word. Jesus said the other thing that causes all our joy, the other in these things in verse 11, is verse 7, my words. Verse 10, keeping my commandments. Well, that doesn't sound so joyful, right? Ah, keeping God's commandments. I got to do that. That's drudgery. Ah, God says do this. God says don't do this. Right? That's boring. Not much joy in that at all. But if you know Jesus, if you're abiding in Jesus, that's not the case at all. Not even a little bit. That's because as believers, as his disciples, our commandment keeping, our obedience to God's word is love born. It's a labor of love that gives us joy. Verse 9 is, The Father has loved me. Jesus said, So have I loved you. Abide in my love. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying he loves you with the greatest love that there ever was. The love that there was with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That love, I'm loving you with that kind of love, Jesus is saying. That's the love that Jesus has for you. It's a love that, that's without beginning. It's a love that's without end. It's a love that's eternal and will be forever, never changing. That's how much Jesus loves you. And he says, verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. When Jesus came, he, he kept all the commandments of God. Every single one. Jesus never sinned. Mind blowing, right? We can't even imagine what that's like. He didn't do it to set, check some sort of box. He didn't do that because someone was going to find out he was going to get in trouble. He didn't do it because of peer pressure. But he did it out of love for the Father, he says. It wasn't drudgery. It wasn't burdensome. It was done with love. And that gave Jesus, he said, inexpressible joy keeping the commandments of God, out of love, with joy. If you love someone, think about this, if you love someone, it doesn't cause you pain. You don't think it's a burden, right, to do something for them, something that they like, right? That gives you inexpressible joy to do something for others. You love to do what pleases them when you love someone. Every morning I, I get up, our alarm goes off, I race downstairs before Christy, to make her coffee because I know how important that first cup of coffee is to her. <laughs> and it gives me joy to love her that way. I don't go, ah, oh, man, I gotta get up, I gotta get up. I'm like, I can't wait to get down there and get her coffee ready for her. And most every night, even though she's been working all day, a lot of hours, stressful job, I'm working two jobs now, um, she goes through what's not trouble at all to her to make our family a really nice meal most nights. And she does it not because she's like, ah, Pastor's wife now, got to make good meals, I guess. You know, she doesn't do that or think like, ah, oh, man, I just got to do this or people are going to think like I'm not a very good wife or a mother. She does it because of the joy that she has for loving us in that way. I'm like, ah, oh, don't make a big meal. She goes, I love to do that. I love my family. It gives me so much joy. Literally, that's what she says. As Randy Alcorn says, if you're really joyful, that joy needs to work its way to your face once in a while. I can see the, the, the joy on Christie's face when she works so hard for our family. And you can see the joy in another believer's eyes. You can see it in their face. 
right? You can see it when they love keeping the Father's commands, when they love serving him, when they love doing what he's asked them to do. You can see it. It's a love-born labor of love that breaks out in joy. Now, I've got to say that doesn't happen in a lot of churches in America right now. It happens in our church. It happens in quite a few. But a lot of churches, it doesn't. The nominal Christian church, I will call it. It's called all kinds of other names. The nominal Christian church in America just loves the idea of Jesus, right? Jesus, he's awesome. We're going to have the manger scene. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. We're going to love Jesus. <coughs> Jesus, man, he's a good example most of the time. He's my life coach. I take my management style from Jesus. Twelve disciples. I have three of my inner circle. Right? They love the idea of Jesus. But they shy away from his commands. They even teach against some of his commands. And they celebrate those things that go against his will and his word. Right? How dare we ever, ever call Jesus Master and Lord and yet reject the truth that he teaches? Reject Jesus' teaching and not only will you have no joy, you'll have no part in him at all. You can't separate Jesus from his word. You can't separate Jesus from his word. You can't have all out joy in Jesus without his word. All out joy comes through abiding in God's word. Well, this pandemic has been horrible. It's been horrible. The effects on all of us, on our families, on our friends, I mean, having to wear these masks, having to be six feet apart, not being able to hug each other. People we know and love getting sick, people we know dying. It's horrible. It's put a dent in people's Christmas joy this season. One example is a letter to Santa that I just read yesterday. Um, it's like we're pretty safe in this crowd. You know, sometimes those letters that go to Santa go to the U.S. Postal Service, and they open them up and they read them. Um, I know it's probably not a crime, but there was one this, that they intercepted from a young girl named Lauren. She was in Washington State, and she writes to Santa, hopefully you've had a better year up at the North Pole. It has been hard here with the virus. People are very sad, and their joy is gone. I hope you can come this year and make us happy again. I pray for you, Santa. I want a Target gift card this Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> The joy that we all need, we're not going to find in Santa. We're not going to find it in that, that Target gift card. We're not going to find it by coming and singing. Just a couple of songs are going to pump us up for a day on Christmas Eve. No. The all-out joy we all need is the joy Jesus brought at Advent, that he brought at Christmas, an ever-growing joy that's yours by abiding in him. Jesus, he's the one who came to be good news of great joy to all peoples, for unto them was born that day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And that little baby came, Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy, for the joy that was set before him, enduring the cross, despising the shame, and now seated at the right hand of the throne of God till he comes back. Fix your eyes right there. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on a manger that led to a cross, that led to a resurrection. He's the way to all our joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, what a great love you've lavished on us through our son's advent. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for accepting us as we are, but thanking you Thank you for not just leaving us as we are, but pruning away those things that get in the way of our having joy, of our trusting you. Fix our eyes and each other's eyes on the gospel every day, that good news of, of great joy. And while up in us, spirit-flowing love of you that we might consider it joy to do all that you ask, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jesus is freely given, we now freely give our morning tithes and offerings.